Good morning. And um, welcome to day three of the Global Women in Leadership Conference this Friday, April 9th, 2021. My name is Dr. Chiedowan Kuo. I teach with the African Studies um, here at SAIS, and I also direct the SAIS Men Lead um, here. I have um, the pleasure of moderating this really important uh, panel today. This panel will be discussing the feminist foreign policy, <coughs> discussing feminist foreign policy, and it's aptly titled, Is Your Foreign Policy Feminist? Questions and Answers for International Relations in 2021. The concept of feminist foreign policy has undergone a rather interesting evolution, uh, traversing narratives of whether feminism and its associated terms are even acceptable in mainstream international relations. A strand of that argument has been whether sticking to more neutral terms like gender equality, women's empowerment, and so on, are more productive in terms of eliciting the attention of policymakers to the issues that frame the concept. And this has moved on to gaining center stage in the actual practice of foreign policy as states like Sweden, Canada, UK, and uh, more recently Mexico have adopted feminist foreign policy. It has become increasingly clear that therefore, that um, mainstream theories of international relations are perhaps inadequate to fully explain newer dynamics in international affairs, particularly in light of the multiplicity of um, actors and uh, multiplicity of interests. As the critical theorists, including feminist IR, have argued, states need to reassess ideas of what constitutes high politics, right? to reconsider what issues shape national security and recalibrate strategies for achieving foreign policy goals. At no time in history, in recent history, has this need for reassessment and reflection been more urgent and demonstrably crucial than the present as the COVID-19 crisis calls for a rethink of what we know, what is possible and what is valuable. As noted earlier, in recent years, a growing number of states, like those um, just mentioned, have announced their intentions and in fact have in fact adopted a feminist approach to their foreign policy relation practices. Our panelists today will discuss what feminist foreign policy looks like in response to the major international events of the last year where there are opportunities to implement a gender lens to international relations and how communities around the world could benefit from such an approach. Our panelists for this conversation this morning are Sahana Damapuri and Rebecca Tuckenton. Um, Sylvia Tabos has a last minute scheduling conflict and could not join us today, but you know, she's happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. Sahana Damapuri is the director of our Secure Future program at the One Earth Future Foundation. From 2006 to 2016, she was an independent gender advisor on gender, peace, and security issues to USAID, NATO, the Swedish Armed Forces, the United States Institute for Peace, International Peace Institute, and other international development organizations. Most recently, Mrs. Damapuri was a writer resident at the Cary Institute for Global Good, where she completed her first book, Women, Peace, and Security, 10 Things You Should Know. She was appointed a fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government from 2011 to 2013, and was an investing in women in development fellow at the United States Agency for International Development from 2003 to 2005. She has published widely on women, peace, and security issues, including CNN, Christian Science Monitor, the Fletcher Security Review, Hedaya, and the Center for Global Counterterrorism, Women's E News, Human Rights Quarterly, the Global Responsibility to Protect Journal, the Global Observatory, the Alliance for Peaceful Peace Building Online Journal, the Louisiana Literature Review, the US Naval War College Women, Peace and Security Monograph Series and the parameters. 
Good to have you with us, Sahana. Our next panelist is Rebecca Tuckington. Rebecca Tuckington is a Gates Cambridge scholar and PhD student in history at Cambridge University studying transnational feminist networks. She was previously assistant director of the Women and Foreign Policy Program at the Council on Foreign Relations and program manager at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security, where she led the gender and countering violent extremism portfolio and co-authored flagship reports on women's participation in peace processes and transnational justice. She has an MA in security studies from Georgetown University and a BA in international relations and history from Wesley College, where she was a Madeleine K. Albright Fellow. Great to have you with us, Rebecca. Um, and so to begin, um, it is safe to say that there are a, a lot of misconceptions about what feminist foreign policy is. Could you explain what feminist foreign policy means? Um, perhaps we start with you, Rebecca, and then we go to Sahana. Sure. Um, I think Sahana will probably give you a more straightforward answer because I know she's been working with a lot of groups in DC who come up with this really fantastic um, coalition-based definition for how foreign, uh, feminist foreign policy could look in the United States. I am actually a little bit less sure about what feminist foreign policy looks like. And I think this is a really tough question because there's still a lot of disagreement, um, even in the community working on this, about what feminist foreign policy should be. So is it a framework? Is it a way of working? Is it a set of priorities? It is, an, is it an actual policy agenda? There's not a lot of um, agreement there. And last year, actually, on a project I was working on for the Council on Foreign Relations, a colleague and I went through a lot of the existing literature on feminist foreign policy, and we pulled out the different definitions that have been proposed both by states and governments, but also by academics and civil society coalitions, and tried to find where there was common ground. And among all of these definitions, we found that most of them at minimum mandated the following things. So a consistent gender analysis, significant resources, women's representation in decision-making, a link between domestic and foreign policies, so this being a holistic government-wide effort, um, and a transformative approach that seeks to address the root causes of inequality. I think personally, I would say it might even be premature to define what feminist foreign policy should look like in practice. Um, and I sometimes worry that labeling things feminist that are really just policies to advance gender equality within the existing system can weaken the disruptive power of a feminist frame. If they don't take that next step, which is to really address structures and hierarchies. So a real central tenet of feminist theory is reflexivity and this constant questioning of power relations. Um, Cynthia Enlow, who's obviously one of our great feminist IR thinkers, which I hope many of you have come across in your studies, she uses the term uh, feminist curiosity to describe this. So this refusal to take the status quo as a given. And I think that that visionary potential of that kind of feminist thinking that looks beyond the world as it is, that can be lost if we try to fit feminism into the state structures that we already have, many of which are inherently not feminist. Um, so to me, feminist foreign policy is less of a definition and more of a set of questions that we should be asking. Obviously, this is not helpful at all to our colleagues who are doing the real work in agencies every day to try and advance gender equality policies. And um, one thing I really admire about the work that Sahana is doing, um, both at her organization and as part of this broader community in Washington, is really trying to lay out a roadmap for policymakers that translates some of these lofty ideas into real targets. Um, I do think that's absolutely essential. And I think that if states are going to adopt a feminist foreign policy, then we as civil society have to be ready to say, you know, great, here's what you're signing up for. And it's not a new women's economic empowerment program. It is an entire overhaul of your aid budget. So I hope that this conversation can sort of continue along both of those tracks that we can push states to adopt more and more ambitious plans by giving them sort of a definition and a framework to work with, but also that we don't lose sight of this more radical potential of what 
you know, a feminist future could be. I think that ambiguity has a lot of power. Um, and so I think we should be able to continuously revisit and reiterate what feminist foreign policy means. Thank you. Um, quite in, an interesting um, response there. Um, so Sahana, um, do you agree? Um, is there a potential for feminist foreign policy as dis, you know, described uh, within, or oh, I guess I have two questions. One, what do you, um, you know, regard feminist foreign policy? Um, what do you, what's your conception of it? And secondly, how would you respond to Rebecca's uh, submission that very feminist foreign policy as um, you know, conceptualized within predominant you know, practice communities has a tendency to destabilize the radical nature of feminist IR, the goals of feminist IR, if, if I'm, I, I read you right, Rebecca, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to join the panel and it's great to see Rebecca again. Um, and actually, you know, I, I actually agree a lot with Re what Rebecca is saying. Um, I think that one of the really interesting things that we do, we are do, <laughs> that we are doing as a feminist community of practice that is not helping us is trying to silo ourselves and pigeonhole ourselves by um, this power structure of, you know, that uh, every, all states have of ministries of defense, foreign, you know, their diplomacy, their international development. And um, they, those power structures want to define, they want to silo, they want to um, contain the uh, ideas so that they can in their policy machinery, I mean, it's the function of those, these institutions, right? That because this is how they can figure out how to spend the money, where to spend the money, et cetera. And I think the feminist project at heart has always been to, to point out to those power structures, the way you're deciding how to spend the money and what to spend the money on is just not working. And, and in fact, um, I think that one of the things that's really bothered me is that why are we getting ourselves twisted up in a knot about defining what a feminist foreign policy is instead of doing it? And I think the principles that um, Rebecca laid out are exactly of you know gender analysis, increasing women's representation, having significant resources, um, using a government-wide government holistic approach to these problem to these problems we're facing and, and having it be transformative, all of that was planted in the seeds of UN 1325 on women, peace and security 20 years ago. And even before that, these ideas were present in, uh, in CEDA, in Beijing. These are things that feminists from around the world, from civil society, grassroots organizations, outside of state structures, they have been demanding this and asking this for these things in very practical ways. And one of the things I think that is concerning to me about this conversation about feminist foreign policy is that we're talking about it today as if it just er erupted out of the earth in the last year or so, or because France and Sweden decided that they're gonna do it um, versus there are women from the global south all over the world who've been working on these issues for decades and decades to promote human rights, dignity of life, right? New solutions to these problems. Foreign policy, I think, what does foreign policy mean? Foreign policy is about how states relate to other states. It's about, to me, creating a more peaceful, stable world, right? But feminists have a different perspective on how you do that and what that means when states relate to other states. They don't just talk about state security, they talk about individual security. And that, I think we have to go back and read UN 1325, read the text where it says for the first time ever at that highest level of security decision-making, state sovereignty and individual security are equal. And you cannot have state security without 
the equality between men and women. That is the real revolutionary thing that feminists planted in order for us 20 years later to even be talking about, can we have a feminist foreign policy? And I think there is another division that's happening with feminist foreign policy, which is white feminists are using the term feminist foreign policy and trying to define it and contain it and create these documents so that their state structures can adopt it. But in doing that, they're leaving out the decades of, of work and voice um, and effort that non-white women actually did when it wasn't popular, when they weren't getting any support, when it wasn't the thing to talk about. And they actually made structural changes to our policy architecture globally, nationally, and locally. And so these conversations about is feminist foreign policy a framework? Does it have priorities? Does it have an agenda? I would submit, and I do, let us turn back to women, peace, and security, which is the OG of feminist foreign policy. And that provides policy architecture, policy frameworks, sets of priorities, the four pillars, participation, prevention, protection, gender mainstreaming, right? It provides the agenda. It allows for state sovereignty and it allows for difference. It allows for difference in approach and nationality and country priorities. And it's transformative because why? It does what feminists have always said. It gives women a voice and power and agency because the number one thing a feminist foreign policy should do is increase the agency of the most marginalized people to have decision-making power over their lives. And that has always been a central tenet of women, peace, and security to increase the participation of those groups in security governance, right? So anyway, I will stop there because I know you have other questions, but I, you can tell I feel strongly about it. And I do agree with uh, Rebecca on, on many, many of her points. Great, thank you. Um, I mean, there's a whole lot to unpack there and um, I'm really excited to unpack those. But for now, I think let's see um, if we can get in one or two more questions and hopefully we'll have time to you know, go back to that. Um, one of the aims of this conference is to both look back at how recent moments of crisis have exposed fault lines in our countries and in our communities, both here at home and across the world. For example, we watched the COVID-19 pandemic evolve from a health crisis to an economic and social crisis with crippling effects, both for rich and powerful states, as well as uh, for low and middle income countries um, with even more devastating effects for populations, some groups more than others. Another aim of the event uh, is to find within these crisis models that we can use to move us forward in that vein, what does practicing feminist foreign policy mean in the age of a crisis like COVID-19, right? Um, what does the practice of feminist foreign policy entail for COVID both response as well as um, uh, you know, recovery, you, both the response phase that we're in as well as the recovery phase that we're also in, but that we're also anticipating, right? Uh, what channels does a feminist foreign policy lens give us to move forward? Um, do you wanna start off, Sahana? Oh, <laughs> I feel like I talked a lot already. Um, so I will maybe keep this a little brief, but I think um, in practice, I think the things that we talked about uh, in the beginning of the conversation of using a gender analysis on the problem um, understanding that we need significant resources to go in certain places. And then I, you know, that's re the response end of thing. But I also think in the recovery phase and it just even, I would say, practically speaking with um, the government agencies, what are they doing in their after action reporting? What, like, how are they following um, the impact of their programs? Because, you know, as Rebecca pointed out that this 
fe a feminist approach is to have a feedback loop. Like our, our actions are not un like unidirectional, right? Like we are, we're doing something and it's having an impact and we need to know what the impact is and what, what it is we're doing and what the, what can we change, right? In order for it to be more successful. So I'll, I'll leave it at, at that. All right. Um, great. I'm sure you want to respond, Rebecca, but let me just quickly loop in another question here, right? Um, because we don't have much, much time. Um, so because we're talking about feminist foreign policy, right? Clearly, you know, the feminist is um, uh, more of a recent addition to the concept, right, of foreign policy. Um, have you seen U.S. foreign policy evolve over your time working in the field? Um, are there some issues that have migrated from the backwater of diplomacy to the center stage, right? Vice versa. Um, what are some of the opportunities and challenges in promoting a feminist foreign policy lens in the US? Can we, in fact, right? Um, and, and I mean, if we bracket the arguments uh, that Sahana have made, um, that you know, this whole concept of feminist foreign policy is a white feminist um, articulation of wanting to remain, you know, uh, in control of the narrative, right? If we, if we bracket that, um, what are some of the opportunities um, and challenges in promoting a feminist foreign policy lens in the U.S.? Can we, in fact, adopt that, right? Um, uh, as you know, U.S. foreign policy has been security oriented in the past two decades or so. Is the securitization of U.S. foreign policy incompatible with adopting a feminist foreign policy approach. Um, a lot packed in there, but you know, um, I'm very, very confident that you can you know, briefly and quickly get through some of those. Great, well, why don't I start a little bit with the evolution of US foreign policy on this front? Sure. Um, and I will actually just pick up right where Sahana left off. Um, thank you so much for talking about the legacy of this through CEDA, through UN Security Council Resolution 1325. I think it is so true that we need to look further back into the past, um, not just saying that because I'm now a history PhD student. Um, I really do think that this is, so many of these ideas have already existed um, and it's important not to erase that legacy. Um, I think in the United States in particular, a lot of the things that we're talking about that could be part of a feminist foreign policy are things that earlier administrations actually did try to implement in many ways. Um, so certainly you can go back to another great watershed moment in global feminism, the 1995 Beijing World Conference on Women. Um, I'm sure many folks are familiar with Hillary Clinton's speech where she proclaimed women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights once and for all. Um, that wasn't only lip service at the time, you know, she came home and actually the Clinton administration really did try to make um, a lot of efforts in the foreign policy sector to make that a reality. Um, Madeleine Albright was appointed as Secretary of State the next year, and she said in a speech, quote, sorry, it's nice doing this on Zoom because I can pull my quotes up right here and make sure I'm saying them right. Um, advancing the status of women is not only a moral imperative, it is being actively integrated into the foreign policy of the United States, it is our mission. So that was 1996, and that sounds very similar to the types of things that we're talking about today. Um, the creation of the President's Interagency Council on Women was again sort of this early effort to create a whole of government answer to gender inequality. Um, USAID announced that they would formally gender mainstream their operations starting in 1996. Uh, the Office of International Women's Issues at the State Department started putting millions of dollars in women's programming in post-conflict countries. So a lot of this has been part of US foreign policy for many years. Um, and a lot of it has really gained genuine bipartisan support. So certainly on the women, peace and security side, um, we've seen Republicans come out to support that in Congress, women's economic empowerment. Um, there's been a lot of acceleration recently, the Biden administration, of course, both in the personnel that they're appointing, also this new gender policy council in the White House is clearly trying to pick up on a lot of um, this interest as well. So I think the question is, not only how has US foreign policy evolved, but is feminist foreign policy something that's different from this sort of trajectory of including gender equality as a foreign policy priority, which has been part of US foreign policy. Um, and so there I think is your next question. Is feminist foreign policy compatible 
with US foreign policy as it exists today. Um, can you know our focus on women's edu uh, women's economic empowerment, on girls' education, on women, peace and security, can that be divorced from these sort of more radical ideas like reproductive justice, um, real freedom from violence, things that are a little bit less, have a little bit less bipartisan support on the Hill. Um, and I would say that without that holistic approach that includes all of those things, um, we can't really consider these types of policies to be feminist, though we certainly can point to them as examples of advancing gender equality. And I don't think that we necessarily have to do one or the other. I mean, it's critically important to advance gender equality policies in the system that we already have. Um, I think a lot of the things that have been done have been very effective. Um, and yeah, so I, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as it were, to say that we can't have any of these things unless they add up to a feminist foreign policy. These other things do count as well. Um, I think the question of securitization is a very interesting one because as Sahana said, the roots of a lot of this debate are, do come out of the sort of pacifist feminist world. Um, and the women who were fighting to get the UN to adopt 1325, they were not trying to make war better for women, they were trying to end war. And so I think there's a real legacy of that idea. Um, and some of that has been lost as we've tried to adapt women, peace, and security to these existing frameworks. Um, I'm sure Sahana has more thoughts on that, so I will turn it over to her. Um, but just to say, yes, there's a long legacy of advancing gender equality within US foreign policy that I'm not sure I would characterize as feminist. Okay. And uh, Sahana, as you know, as if this is not loaded enough, I'm just gonna tag along um, another question to that um, because of course time, right? Uh, so when we talk about, because this is, it's, you know, looped in, right? That my question is looped into to the one that uh, Rebecca just tackled. Uh, so when we talk about for feminist foreign policy in the post-pandemic environment, which of course is all the discussion right now, right? Um, uh, we cannot feign ignorance of the domestic economic realities, particularly um, for the US, right? Uh, because it has had quite a difficult experience dealing with the pandemic. Um, what is your take on arguments that insist on focusing our attention on domestic issues um, consolidating resources to tackle the multiple issues of social, racial, and economic justice that has roiled the country in the past couple of years, and only resume substantive international development policy when the home front is stabilized, so to speak, right? Um, so not to name names, but we, you know, we kind of know where this whole thing is coming from, right? Um, are we first or, you know, are we last are we putting us first are we putting us last right um so what what do you think okay so let me just understand the question first so we're we're saying that the narrative right now is <clears throat> because we have so many problems in this country that we haven't really addressed we really need to clean up our own house before we focus on our, our foreign policy agenda? Is that the question? Well, that's one skill of thoughts. Yeah. Right. And um, the that's the eminent school of thoughts just before the change, you know, in administration. And there are still that voice is still loud, right? And um, clear. Uh, but this is in contrast to what we would regard as the uh, traditional uh, approach, right, which has been that, you know, our domestic policy um, is all tied into international, into foreign uh, policies, and as such that they both go, uh, both go hand in hand, right? Mm -hmm. so should we actually, um, because we have multiple hydra-headed issues here at home, right, should we focus on home, right, and get home front sorted out? Or is there value in the pre-existing conception of stability, growth, and, um, and uh, development as tied both to the first and second images? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in my, my personal opinion is that um, we can't really separate the two. We, that 
as a country, I think it is good that we are reflecting on the problems that we've had internally and that they're becoming and have become very visible and vocal. And these are difficult conversations to have, but they're very important conversations to have. And I don't think as a country, we can um, evolve without paying attention to what's happening at home. And I think that the, it's not disconnected from what we're doing internationally. The things that we're doing domestically are, are informing the people inside of our agencies, right? Who do foreign policy, who, who are in the Defense Department, who are in USAID, who are in State Department um, about things like diversity and inclusion, about gender equality in a very personal level Right, but that is obviously as a human being that spills over into your perspective on your work too. And I think, and I hope that, you know, this is actually equalizing in, in, in many ways that it's raising the issue of equality domestically and it's raising the issue of equality in our international relations and, and thinking, right? Because once you see it one place, you can't unsee it the other in another place. And I think that it's exactly the kind of thing we have needed to do for a very, very long time as a country. So, I mean, you're right. I think that there are different schools of thought. There are different um, people that think that an emphasis needs to be on one thing instead of the other. But my feeling is one thing that is has always amazed me about feminist thinking, which to me, feminist thinking is really just a person, a man, woman, whoever, whatever gender identity you are, um, believing in the equality of all people and having the respect for the dignity of all people, right? So if we, if, if every, if I could distill all of that noise down to, if that's what it's, it's getting the individual person to do, whether it's a police officer in a small town in the US or it's a, um, you know, a, a political officer sitting in a US embassy somewhere. Like I want that person to have that perspective to come from that place as a human being when they are looking at these problems we are facing as a society. And I, and I think also one thing I, if I can add about COVID, I know that the news daily stinks. I know that there's horrible things that are happening all over the world and it's been pretty bad for people to be stuck in the pandemic all over. And there's a lot of things that are wrong, but I will say this, that it is astounding to me that People all over this world, when faced with a pandemic, which is basically possible extinction of human life on the planet, somehow, somehow, we were able as human beings to come together. And some people were willing to work on finding vaccines. Some people were willing to negotiate where those vaccines were going and getting them to people. Some people were willing to put their lives online and, and help people in their communities or serve because they had to in grocery stores, in taxi drivers. Some people, the fact that human beings came together to survive, right? To the point where we actually now have vaccines. Yes, it's not equal, 100%. Not everybody is going to get them the way we would like them to get them. But the fact that human beings actually came together to solve this problem that way is something I don't think we appreciate enough because it shows the resourcefulness and the resilience of human beings to be creative when faced with these problems. And I think that that's what we need to do with feminist foreign policy. We need, like Rebecca said, this ambiguity is good. It's not a bad thing. It's making us be more resourceful and creative in, in solving problems. And that's what, that's what, to me, that's what this is about. Foreign policy is about making the world a better place for people. And feminism is a lens that can really help us do better at that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, Rebecca, maybe perhaps let me move on a little bit. Um, and if you want to 
you know, follow up with that, you know, feel free. Um, following up with the security theme though, right? <laughs> Which we know is a central pillar of foreign policy for the US, right? As for other states. Recent st uh, studies have shown that women's participation in peace negotiation increases the durability of peace agreements, right? Um, I think the figure is about 64%, right? If you have women and civil society organizations involved in peacemaking uh, uh, processes, that the tendency for it to last is, you know, 64% or something. Uh, I think that's about the, the, the data. Um, a 2016 report published by the Council on Foreign Relations, which you should know more about, right, um, found that women's participation in conflict prevention and resolution advances U.S. security interests, right? Go figure. <laughs> Do you think feminist foreign policy can shed more light on this phenomenon, right? Why do some advocates of women's inclusion, that's one, two, why do some advocates of women's inclusion in peace processes insist on specific models of advancing the agenda, right? What would you prescribe as a model to involve more women in peace and security decisions? So I really like this question because I think that a feminist approach to women, peace and security is really important. Um, I think that a lot of those studies that indicate there's a link between women's participation and better outcomes sometimes tend to flatten those findings to make it seem like it's just sort of add women and stir, like add women and then peace processes last longer. And I think um, both in my work at CFR in Georgetown, and I'm sure Sahana's work as well, because she's deeply involved in this space, um, show that it's actually a lot more nuanced than that. And I think that this feminist idea of breaking down all power hierarchies um, can really help to show the nuance um, and why it can, why it matters and how we add women, um, but also how it can make broader peace processes stronger. So I had a chance in my work at Georgetown to um, study women's pathways into peace talks in Northern Ireland, Kenya, Guatemala, and the Philippines. And we found that there's not always a direct causal link. You know, there's certainly women who are come to the table as representatives of a particular political party, per se, and not necessarily as a voice of their gender. But women often come to the table as civil society representatives, or they may have a background in education or victims' rights, or they simply had different experiences of the conflict. And those are the things that can really make peace processes richer. Um, just to touch on Northern Ireland, which is sort of my case study of expertise, the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition ended up with two seats at the 1998 Good Friday talks, which actually resolved on this day um, in 1998. So happy anniversary to that. Um, they made sure that the final agreement included things like a mechanism for civil society participation in future governance, or a commitment to desegregated education, or the promise of equal political participation for women. None of those things would have been a topic of discussion if they had not come out of education, out of civil society, out of understanding how the, why those other perspectives matter, not just for the immediate peace talks, but for the long-term implementation of this agreement and of governing their country. So I think feminist foreign policy really does offer a tool that says it's not just enough to add women in bits and pieces. We need to really shake up who has a voice at these critical moments of transition, where the future of the country is being hammered out. Um, that means not just women, but really a whole cross section of women, a whole cross section of society should have a voice. Um, so I think, yes, Women, Peace and Security has taught us that adding women does lead to better security outcomes, but it's also because of the diversity of experience they bring to the table and bringing a diversity of people to the table, regardless of gender, but ensuring sort of different experiences of conflict um, can really help create stronger societies in the future. So. Um, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and so, um, Sana, I'm going to just, again, tag along uh, on that question, just in case you want to uh, address that. But this time, it's going to be an audience question from Salma El Masari. And she wants to know, um, have any states sufficiently upheld a holistic feminist foreign policy agenda? So, um, you know, I, if, I don't know if you want to take this and then um, <laughs> briefly. <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> I think I'm not, okay, so I'm not exactly sure what they mean by upheld, but I definitely think there are states that 
that are starting to be interested in adopting um, something that might look like a feminist approach. And I would say feminist approach to policies versus a feminist foreign policy. But I would also say, okay, let's go back to women, peace and security. There are 85 plus countries in the world that have adopted national action plans on women, peace and security, which are feminist policy exercises at security governance. And that's exactly what Re Rebecca said. It's civil society participating in decision-making with existing power structures and identifying what are the priorities, the needs, the values, um, the, the projects that people need to address things under protection issues, participation issues, prevention of conflict, gender mainstreaming, relief and recovery, right? Those documents are feminist foreign policies. And they have all the elements of this transformative approach, holistic approach across governments, et cetera, right? So I think we have to look very carefully when we're talking about when states official structures overtly say, make announcements, we're going to adopt a feminist foreign policy and look at the process that they're using to do it versus when states are also quietly engaged, many, many more states are quietly engaged in national action plan development, which is not a big flashy announcement, but is certainly years of hard work and changing state behavior in terms of including civil society in state decision-making, which is a very difficult thing to do. I don't know of any other policy issue set in international relations that includes civil society in that way, that has produced actionable documents of which they're not very well funded, but maybe a quarter of these national action plans are funded. But look, I haven't seen anything that has changed security governance as much in any other policy agenda in including civil society voices, so. Right, all right, well, thank you um, for responding to that. Um, and so if maybe uh, we'll just continue with you, Sahana, um, feminist foreign policy uh, states developed and directed activities as you just um, you know, narrated. Uh, they have state developed and directed activities and not necessarily within the purview of individual action, right? Um, but we also know that contrary to established ideas of what influences foreign policy, Domestic issues have come to play a key role in shaping a, a country's foreign policy, right? Like you, you rightly just talked about, you know, um, civil society and all that. Are there roles for individuals in the process? Can individuals, in fact, influence uh, the development or adoption of feminist foreign policy in this country? And if that is the case, um, how do we relate men, right, uh, to the issue of foreign policy, if we uh, permit my, you know, simplicity here, if, you know, foreign policy um, is basically more of a gender analysis and, you know, um, so I am of course assuming gender to be women, right? Here, yeah, just pardon me for a moment, right? Um, so are men important actors in developing and adopting a feminist foreign policy approach to, for a country? If so, what are the possibilities or prospects of uh, engaging more men? How might more men get involved or engaged in prompting feminist um, foreign policy, right? So one is individuals as a whole, and then secondly is uh, men as part of that population, right? Yeah, no, great question. So um, I could go on about, about, about both of those things, but I'll just say, um, so on the question of the individuals influencing policy domestically um, in the US, yes, in, uh, for example, something we're, we've been working on, I've been working on very closely is standing up a Women, Peace and Security Congressional Caucus, which is bipartisan here in the US. And um, so it's in 2017, there was a Women, Peace and Security 
uh, legislation that was adopted. It was had bipartisan support, and it's the first of its one of the first of its kind in, in the world. I think Israel is the first to actually make legislative changes um, regarding women, peace, and security. But the U.S. is now second and actually has this law. It's not funded, but it definitely has uh, bipartisan support and a lot of commitments and actually um, direction to and requirements to the White House and um, Department of Defense, State Department, USAID, and DHS, the Department of Homeland Security to produce strategies on implementation. And a lot of work has gone into that and also monitoring evaluation, and it continues. So how does that involve the individual person. So we um, decided, you know, we think there should be a, a congressional caucus or a con congressional commission to provide oversight on these issues and to encourage the administration, whoever that is, to actually um, ad adhere to the commitments in the law. Um, and this caucus would be a way for individual citizens to actually participate and ask questions of their members, of uh, their representatives from where they live. Are you involved in this? Are you working on women, peace, and security? What are we doing on in involving women in the Afghan negotiations, for example, because we it's law? This is something any U.S. citizen can write their representative about because we have successfully established a bipartisan caucus and now has um, 21 members, both Democrat and Republican, and if they've held several hearings already that are, are on Zoom, inviting women's civil society to them, and we've done some staffer trainings, and we've gotten a lot of interest in that. And then in terms of men, I'll just be really quick and say gender, um, strictly speaking, is not about women using gender analysis. is a skill set. It's a critical thinking skill set and it's something everyone can learn to do and in fact uh, we go back to talking about change transformative the transformative nature of a feminist approach one of the things that happened that is funny that women peace builders sort of dismayed up but it actually is very positive in a feminist perspective is it has changed um military structures to include gender military advisors at strategic, operational, and tactical levels. And those gender military advisors, since they have to come from the military and the military nationally or globally are male dominated, it's men. It's men that have to be trained, military officers that have to be trained on how to use a gender perspective, how to be a gender advisor. And that has been going on for the last at least 10 years, if not more. That is a huge structural change. It's a framework change. It's a priority change. It's an agenda change. All the things that we want. So I think we have to be more patient about how long it's going to take us to see the kind of transformation we want on the one hand. On the other hand, I think we have to be really radical in our thinking about what are the things we're trying to do to change. Like we can be a little bit more creative about the uh, solutions and approaches that we have to things. So men, yes, definitely, they have to be involved. And there's a great book called The Good Guys that came out by these two professors from the Naval War College that works specifically on this issue. So if your students are interested, I, I'd recommend that. Right, great. And then that's also part of why schools like SICE exist, right? And perhaps one thing that might help is in um, creating curriculum that addresses these kinds of issues, right? Mm -hmm. So that we have men in, in the classes that then go on to occupy these policy areas that actually understand what we mean by gender and gender analysis, right? Um, and so Rebecca, I don't know if you want to uh, follow up with that, but then just to link another question to right, right? Mm -hmm. Right to this. Um, Talking about individual purview, and uh, you know, fem uh, individuals, males, females, um, bringing it down to just students right now, right? What are the key lessons for students wishing to contribute to feminist foreign policy to learn from this? Yeah, well, I would first um, encourage you to look at Sahana's Women, Peace and Security Caucus. Um, I really do think that it would be wonderful to have more of a domestic constituency on gender and foreign policy. Um, this is not an issue often that, you know, 
people around the country are thinking about, and it's often coming from pressure of groups in Washington, D.C. And I think it is something that actually is deeply related to a lot of people's lives. You know, people do care about this. People do want to make the world more equal. And I think that you have the opportunity, you know, whatever state you're from, if you're not from D.C., write to your elected officials um, and make sure that they know that these issues are out there, that they know that there's legislation they can support. Um, I think the WPS caucus is a really great way to collect some of those opportunities so you as a constituent can see what's out there and what your elected officials could be reporting, uh, supporting. And then I also think given that this is SICE, a lot of you are probably going to be going into the foreign policy world. And most of you probably will not be going into gender positions because that's definitely more of a niche field still. And so you can still bring a feminist lens to your work. Like we need feminists in every regional office, in every US aid contractor, in every international NGO. You should be asking these types of uncomfortable questions in meetings. You know, make sure that the grants that you're writing, that the programs you're designing are getting a gender analysis. Most of your organizations will probably have gender experts in them. And I can tell you from experience that a lot of folks are not asking for their advice. So make sure that if you are working on a project that you're looping in your gender team. Um, even things, really small things, you know, if you go to a think tank panel, ask a question about gender in the Q&A, because then the people on that panel will have to prep talking points for it next time. Mm -hmm. And I think even just small things like that are really important. You know, if people start going to panels and they realize that they need to know something about this, it forces them to go back to their staff and get that research and get that information. So I think there's small and big things you can do throughout your career on this. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and so when we talk about foreign, uh, feminist foreign policy, for, you know, foreign policy in general, and then feminist foreign policy, right? Um, as have been, you know, as you have both um, implied, um, there is this assumption of a hierarchical movement, right? Um, you know, of course, we know the... Um, we know where that came from. And so if we want to logically extend that line of thinking, right, um, are there possibilities of doing more harm than good in adopting a feminist foreign policy, right? How can feminist foreign policy adapt to different regions and cultures? Um, feel free to jump in. Well, I can start because this is actually very much related to what my PhD research is on. I'm looking at sort of colonialism within the global women's movement um, in the 1930s and 40s. And so I can tell you for sure there is a long legacy of imperial feminism in which women from the global north have been able to you know, disconnect decolonization from their idea of feminism. Um, not only just turning a blind eye to what their countries are doing abroad, but often participating in the colonial project um, and using that participation as a way to claim citizenship rights for themselves. So there's definitely a legacy and I think that it still has a lot of hold, especially in development policy. Um, and I think one of the big goals of a feminist foreign policy should really be moving material power and resources to the women who are most affected by these issues that we've been talking about. Um, and I think one way to make sure that policies are sensitive to particular places and contexts is to just give money to feminists in those places and allow them to tackle these challenges in their own communities in the way that they see fit. I mean, right now, the amount of development funding that goes to local women's organizations is infinitesimal. You know, funding for gender equality from 2017 was about 4% of bilateral aid from donor countries. And of that money, 1% went to local women's rights organizations. 1% of money already earmarked for gender equality programming. So I think changing that requires a huge overhaul of how the government and how big foundations also give grants. It ch means changing the types of reporting that they require, the latitude and the time frames that they give grantees, how they deal with privacy issues, how we implement anti-terrorism financing regulations. I mean, it's not easy to do this, but I do think that that should be a core part of feminist foreign policy is taking this on. Right, um, thank you. Um, Sahana, so I'm going to ask that you respond to this in um, less than a minute, and then um, 
<laughs> okay, a minute. How about a minute for two questions, right? There, be unfair. Uh, so one, how do um, Alexis Claire Rohirik, um, I, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, um, once is asking, how do we develop a domestic constituency? And um, just you know, to add to that, um, from your practice, how have you encountered resistance to implementing feminist foreign policy? And how did you work to address and move past this resistance? Um, I think we're coming up on time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just say I agreed with everything Rebecca said, so we can just <laughs> take that and <laughs> move on. Um, I 100% agree with the more money to women's rights groups uh, locally. Um, domestic constituency and resistance. So how do we build it? Well, first of all, what I found in the US is when I start, when I speak to women's groups or any groups really, even military groups, they're, they don't even know that we have a law on women, peace and security. Like that's the first place is let people know that we have an actual law on women, peace and security. And something students could do is you guys could write op-eds in your local newspapers and spread it around. You guys could, there's a lot of, and I know you guys are gonna, this is where I think being creative is interesting. You guys could, I don't know, YouTube about it. You could be on podcasts about it. You could, whatever, you know, the, there's so many other ways of, of sharing information um, that are fun and creative that we could get this across to domestic constituencies. And I think it really resonates actually with a lot of women's groups in this country, like Moms for Clean Air, Moms Physicians, uh, you know, group, blah, 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 right? So there's a lot of things that we could do. And then resistance, I think, is just we see that all the time. And the, I, my view is the more resistance you get, I think it's a sign that you're doing something right. Right. So that's where I would leave it. I would say, don't worry about the resistance. When you get it, look at it as a sign is that you're pushing against the right doors and just keep forging ahead because there's a lot of people behind you and there's a lot of people with you. And the one last thing I would say to this group is don't forget about the intergener intergenerational transfer of information between feminists and the different generation of feminists, but also for my age group and older, we need to do a better job of interacting with younger feminists, younger generation of feminists, because they have a, they have a different approaches to yeah. how to do feminism too. And there's, there's a great organization called Frida that you guys should look into. They have a fantastic way of doing grants and funding that's very different than the traditional model. And I, I think it's really inspiring. And we that's, I think, the thing that we need to do better at is the intergenerational um, work of feminism. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, right um, a time here. And so, I mean, just to conclude, right? Um, and picking up on what you, you've said, Rebecca, and what you've said, Sahana, um, and reiterate those points together, right? Um, I think one of the key points that are fixed in both your responses is, you know, the possibilities for action, right? Uh, what are some of the possibilities for action? And if I were to sum up all of that, um, is that the possibilities for action should reflect the understanding that our national and domestic uh, development, peace, safety, growth occur within the context of similar um, positive global currents, right? Vice versa. Uh, it advances the understanding that global issues require local actions and local issues require global actions, right? So interdependencies are locked in. Uh, for example, we all know that borders, our boundaries are less effective, we know that now, in keeping them out and keeping us safe, right, uh, so to speak. Uh, COVID-19 has made it all too clear that safety is a collective concept. No one is safe except all are safe. So this calls for a global partnership in resetting the post-pandemic global economic order through the engagement of not only bilateral, but as, all, as well as multilateral arrangements, right? Including intergovernmental, um, international non-governmental compacts and, and the rest of them. Um, and others have key roles to play in ensuring a human-centered, gender-responsive, care-focused post-pandemic recovery agenda, right? Which is a longer way of expressing the need for glo to globalize and normalize 
feminist foreign policy if we still, you know, um, adopt that phrase, uh, phrase for now. Um, so this has been an absolutely enriching conversation. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Sahana, for taking time from your busy schedule to participate in the panel this morning. And thank you to all of you out there uh, that have uh, joined us. Um, may I remind you, however, that um, the next session, which is on gender and governance lessons from the pandemic, will begin at 11.30 a.m. EDT. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great to talk with you. Likewise. Yes.